Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscriptions available at bakerstreetjournal.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 138. The War Service of Sherlock Holmes. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a strong In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. Your Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jacket office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, hello there. Once again, and welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Burt Walder. And we are digging, toiling in the trenches every day in the world of Sherlock Holmes for you. Do, do, do you feel like it's like it's trench work or more vineyard work? I've, I've heard. Oh, it both oh, ways. that has yeah, it has to be the vineyard. The vineyard is a much better uh, surround for this sort of activity. Well, there's a nice payoff at the end of vineyard work, isn't there? There is a nice payoff, although I must say I think my boots are full of water, so maybe there is a little trench work. <laughs> Well, I'm over here like Lucy and Ethel in the in the grape vat. <laughs> oh, no, it wasn't Ethel. It was just Lucy and the just the, the Italian woman. That's right. <laughs> that classic scene. Uh, well, you know, we are off to a rip roaring start in 2018. We've had uh, a couple of great episodes already, and here we are into uh, the third episode. And wow, this marks our 138th appearance on this program together, and our guests this time around, uh, Andy and Bob, uh, as you will hear, are with us for an, an unprecedented amount of times, and I'm surprised they keep coming back. <laughs> well, they just keep producing interesting and fascinating things, but that's right. I think this must, this has to be a record in maybe a record in literary societies, but certainly a record in the in the Baker Street scene of two folks who have edited uh, so many publications and produced such a uh, string of volumes for so few for so yeah, few well, well let's let's help we can let's hope we can sell a few volumes here uh, I, I I think the conversation will um, ultimately lead in that direction. Yes. Well, before we go in that direction, just a reminder that you can find the show notes for this episode at uh, ihose.co slash ihose138, ihose.co slash ihose138, all lowercase. Uh, there on that page, you can find uh, the timed notes to this episode. Uh, you can find links uh, that are appropriate to what we're talking about in today's episode. Uh, you can also find, obviously, the audio player and, more importantly, a little Patreon button inviting you to become a patron of the arts. And that means supporting what we do here. Uh, if you are so inclined and you would like to help support us over time, on a per episode basis, Patreon makes that possible. Uh, if we don't produce episodes, you don't get charged. It's that simple. Uh, so think about doing that. If you can help us support the costs that go into, uh, producing and providing, uh, this kind of entertainment to the Sherlockian world, it would be greatly appreciated. And just so you know, we do have a goal. We would love to get up to, uh, the $100 
uh, per show mark. We are almost there. I think we're at $89 per show that collectively everyone is supporting. And the reason that the $100 mark is so important to us is because when we do reach that mark, uh, we will be able to afford to do a high-quality transcription service. And that is important because we have heard from a number of Sherlockians who are hard of hearing or hearing impaired, and a transcript would allow them to enjoy the show just as much as you who are listening right now. So if you could, band together, help us reach that $100 per episode uh, sponsorship mark so we can put that money toward transcription services. That would be of great help. Well, in the meantime, why don't you help yourselves to our friends over at Wessex Press? The ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex has been besieged by Americans applying for citizenship. If we had a website, it would have crashed by now. Sadly, your application must wait until we finish converting all our road signs to classic Britonic, our ancient ancestral Celtic language. But the weeks will fly by when you open your copy of A Curious Collection of Dates Through the Year with Sherlock Holmes from our Wessex Press. Its 352 pages highlight every day of the year with significant events from the Sherlockian universe. And New Year's Day is the perfect time to turn to page one. Friends, it's the time of year when yellow leaves, or none, or few, do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold. In these days of autumn splendor, reach for the pleasure only a volume from the Wessex Press can provide. Choose yours today. Ah, I always enjoy a trip in time and space. Back to the age and place of Wessex. Yeah, pretty soon you're going to need a visa to get there, though. <laughs> well, you know, with the whole Brexit thing, and you know, I, I don't know. I, would, would would that affect TARDIS travel? Do you know? Oh, I don't think I don't think anything can affect TARDIS travel. <laughs> Good to know. But my TARDIS is in the shop. It uncharacteristically became smaller on the inside than it was on the outside. <laughs> it turned into an actual police box. <laughs> That's right. Good Lord. <laughs> Well, call the police, wake the friends, phone the neighbors. Uh, it is time for us to welcome back Robert, Bob Katz, and Andrew, Andy Solberg to the program. Uh, Bob and Andy have been co-editors of five volumes of the BSI Manuscript Series. Uh, this is the latest. This is Trenches, the war service of Sherlock Holmes, where... Uh, they got contributors to talk about World War I, uh, to talk about the manuscript from His Last Bow, and the story that goes into the discovery and uh, inclusion of the manual in this volume is really something. We think you're going to want to stay tuned for this particular interview. Bob and Andy, welcome back to the show. Well, good Thank to you. be here. Yeah. Great to be here. Thank you very yeah. much. So this is now officially your fifth time on the show together talking about a BSI manuscript series. Just as a refresher, you were first on uh, episode 50 talking about A Golden Passage. And that, of course, is the manuscript to, what, The Golden Pansne, right? Yeah, and then you were the on. wrong. No, it's the wrong passage. The wrong passage. The, the book was called That's the right. wrong. You're, you're right. I called the episode the golden passage. The wrong passage. That's right. Right. Yeah. Uh, you were on uh, episode sixty three, talking about irregular stain, which of course is which one was that? Second stain. Second stain. Second stain. And then you were on episode seventy six, out of the abyss for. Uh, the Empty House, and Very Steve Rothman was with us for that yep. one. Oh, that's right, and we got into that that heated discussion about Dr. Rosenbach. Yes, and he says hello. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, uh, episode 93, talking about 
Nerve and Knowledge, which was not anything to do with a manuscript series, but it was a uh, a compendium of papers on medicine in the canon, something that both of you know something about. So here we are. And those, ro- and those royalty checks have helped with the mortgage. We really appreciate them. <laughs> yeah, we got we got double the amount for Nerve and Knowledge than we've gotten for any of the uh, uh, manuscript series. Right, our previous appearances. <laughs> so, so $2 then. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. Nope, not even that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, this is it. This is the fifth time. This is episode 138. There's been quite a gap since we spoke with you last, so I'm glad we have this opportunity to have you back in here. This book, this book is it's sizable. Uh, that that was the first thing that impressed me, and it's it, 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 the the title once again is something to arrest one's attention. Trenches. Can you can you expand upon that and just give us a a thumbnail as to what it is we're likely to see in trenches? Well, first of all, the fact that the book is sizable is related really to the origin of the book. This didn't start out to be a uh, a manuscript series book. We didn't have a, a availability of the manuscript when Bob came to me and said, why don't we do a book on Sherlock Holmes in World War I? Because 2018 will be the 100-year anniversary of the armistice. And I thought it was a great idea. And so we put together a proposed table of contents uh, for a book on World War I that we pitched to, at the time, Michael Keane and uh, John Berquist. And, and they loved the idea. And Michael Keane owns the manuscript to Ypres, uh, September 1915. It's a poem by uh, Conan Doyle about World War I. And he said that we could put that in the book. And then, Bob, you want to take it from here? Yeah. So, well, when we, when we talked about doing the book about um, Sherlock Holmes and World War I, of course, when you think of that topic, his last bow, of course, immediately comes to mind. And it was our understanding, and, and I think it was sort of universally understood, that, first of all, the manuscript of his last bow was owned by an anonymous uh, owner, and that for whatever reason, it was not going to be available for any type of publication. So when you think about it, if if, if you go ahead and do a book on Sherlock Holmes in World War One, you're kind of doing a book about his last bow, even if it isn't about his last bow right. specifically, and you don't have the manuscript. Uh, so as Andy said, then we, we, we got the go-ahead from, from John and, and Mike Keene, and as we started to contact um, potential contributors, obviously the word got out, and the Sherlockian grapevine started, uh, started humming, and, and Mike Keene offered us uh, the, the manuscript for the, the Arthur Conan Doyle poem, and then, literally, um, manna f- f- uh, fell from heaven, I think is as good a term as, as I can use. And we were contacted by an intermediary who said that the intermediary had been in touch with the still anonymous donor. And to this day, neither Andy nor I know the identity of the owner of this manuscript. Do we know the identity of the intermediary? Uh, we we do. do, yes. Are you yes, able to say do. who that is? I Rather, that individual chose to come forward okay. on, on his or her own. I okay. mean, I, I don't think it's it's a big problem, but I'd rather leave that decision to the intermediary. Fine. But it's 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 a very good person <laughs> who was very helpful. Anyway, the intermediary contacted us and said that would we like to use the manuscript for our book on World War One? Mm. And of course, Andy and I fainted and, and <laughs> jumped for joy simultaneously. And, uh, of course, we, we, we did. And at that point, we, what we realized is that, in effect, we, we really put together a BSI manuscript series book um, that was simply lacking the manuscript. And all of the chapters that we'd, we'd commissioned and, and worked on with potential contributors 
fit without without certainly having to remove any um, as a manuscript series book. And then when we got the the um, the word that we could that we could publish the manuscript itself, it basically was just a question of uh, talking to Andy Andy Fusco, the the series editor for the BSI manuscript series. And Andy Andy Fusco smart and knows a good thing when he sees it, so he said sure. And then we put together the rest of the sort of BSI manuscript series team, which is Phil Bergham, who does the the transcription and annotation, and Randall Stock, who does the history of the manuscript. And at, at the same time, Costa Rizakis was was kind enough to offer us the the use of his uh, the illustrations, the original Frederick Dorr Steele, Steele illustrations that he has for the story. And and the the fifth one, there were five, is in the possession of the University of Minnesota. It was a gift of uh, a friend of many of ours, the late Alan Mackler, and they were kind enough to allow us to use it. So all of a sudden, going from a book that was just about Sherlock Holmes in World War One, it morphed into this this very, um, I think it's fair to say, elaborate manuscript series book. Does that, does that, does that sound accurate, Andy? Yeah. So we, we were thrilled, and um, at that point we just went ahead with the usual process of, of working on a manuscript series book, and we fortunately were able to get get just a wonderful group of contributors. Even Burr Walder oh. is, is joined in and, and is, is represented in this volume. Well, that just shows you'll take anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, Bert's, you know, Bert's chapter makes the book. Absolutely. Uh, well, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, we were thinking of issuing it as a separate volume. <laughs> That's what charging... <laughs> Oh come on! No, it, but it, it it shows to me the interrelatedness of everything we do as Sherlockians, and and how uh, one of the reasons we asked Bert to to do that chapter beyond the fact that he's just a good writer um, is that Bert, as you remember, you and I both spoke at I think it was around the 2011 BSI yeah. dinner, yeah, um, about yep. Sherlock Holmes in America during that you know when he was Mister Altamont, and and you spoke about. Chicago, and we both spoke about issues involving you know Chicago and Buffalo and that kind of thing, and and Andy and I remember that you'd given a lovely paper, and that it would uh, uh, you know, that would be a very good starting point for the paper that that you actually contributed to this book. So it's interesting how good ideas in the Sherlockian world managed to get used more than once. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I I remember that BSI dinner, and I hated you two because you both. <laughs> gave your presentations without any notes. That's right. <laughs> and I know that you, you always do that, and, and I, I'm just so unable to do that in any way that I'm just envious of both of you. Ah, uh, well. I, you know, the, sent you by both me and Bert, right, Bert? <laughs> well, that comes from having a completely empty mind, and so with <laughs> all this space... Uh, <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're really not thinking about anything and you're generally ignorant, it's easy to memorize all these. Things. <laughs> um, and you and, know, and in my case, if you don't bother to prepare in advance, you learn how to ad lib very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, and Andy, I, 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 I wonder. I would encourage I wondered, you. Bob, why you, why you, Bob, I wondered why you were talking uh, during your paper about the table settings in the room. That, that, now I understand. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you can't waste any ideas, you know. <laughs> And Andy, no, I, but it was it was I, Andy and I remembered that that you had given that nice presentation, and, and we thought some variation on that theme would would work well, and it and it did. So so why don't we why don't we turn the tables a little bit here, and Bert, why don't you tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about your chapter in this book? Oh well, I will do the. <clears throat> um, let me let me make a point first, which we can then you know come back to. And that is about the the scope of the, what's make what makes trenches really interesting, despite the fact that I have uh, a chapter in here, is that uh, the scope of the writers and the topics and the opportunity for people to encounter information here that they wouldn't get in any other form, but is deeply interesting and just. Um, and I want to come back to that. But for example, you know, we've had Glenn Maranker on the show and Glenn gave a great talk also at Chautauqua about the 
trench publications, the soldiers' publications, the soldiers' newsletters in World War I. And he has uh, acquired a massive amount of information about the history of this as well as many, many, many examples of these publications and how Sherlock Holmes featured and how the soldiers used these publications to relieve their tension and to provide entertainment. And it's a fascinating, wonderful story. Well, you are not going to be able to read anything about that unless you have a copy of trenches. And so there are a couple of things like that that um, you know really seem to me to be remarkable, including our pal Rebecca Romney, who has a chapter in here that goes back really in such an interesting way to the origins of Sherlockian criticism uh, as biblical exegesis and, and touching on these kinds of themes. But my chapter, the sad part about my chapter is that that original uh, paper, that conversation at the Baker Street Irregulars dinner, what I really liked about that was the parallels between von Bork as a spy master and the real uh, von Bork. Uh, there was, uh, you know, to reduce it to a sentence, there was a German consul in London operating around that time who, if you look at his profile and what other people have written about him, um, does seem to be quite a corporeal inspiration for von Bork. But because I did that, I couldn't put that <laughs> into this chapter. So what I found interesting about this when I was you know, asked to write something related but new about it was – the opportunity that I had through some research to discover what had been completely unknown to me, which was the vast and detailed network of real German espionage activity in America and in Canada around uh, the time leading up to and then during the early days of World War I and its connection to Irish secret societies, you know, which is passed off in a sentence by Conan Doyle. Uh, when we hear Altamont explain how he came to the notice of von Bork and what his scheme was. But it turns out that there was, you know, a deep, detailed and enormous collaboration between those folks who wanted an armed rebellion against Britain and German interests. And it also featured into, uh, Germany's interests in, in promoting independence in India, the whole idea being that if the Brits had to worry about an Irish insurrection on the one side and an Indian rebellion on the other, that would be that much less resource to bear in their reactions to the European conflict. But um, So that's really what my chapter is all about. But, but really what I enjoyed um, most, and you can find it in the chapter, is – and my particular chapter is really the, just the last couple of paragraphs because in the course of my research, I discovered that there really was an inspiration for the notion of a British secret agent infiltrating Irish secret societies. And it also had implications for the character of Bertie Edwards in Valley of Fear. And that was, you know, in brief, the real life story of a fellow named – uh, Thomas Miller Beach, who wound up, who was a Brit who wound up in France, who followed his pals to America in the 1860s, got involved in the Civil War, and then spent 25 years as basically a spy inside Irish secret societies in America. So, so that is an overlong answer, but it, it's just part of the, uh, you know, what we've discussed in the past is sort of the rabbit hole. <laughs> of of this interest where one fact leads to another and you never know what you're going to discover. You know, that's one of the things I love about Sherlockian writing is that you have these adults all over the world who are accomplished, intelligent, busy, and yet they donate their time. And it, it must have taken Bert a, a substantial amount of time to do all the research necessary to write these incredibly well researched chapters for these books and and people do it again and again and again because of their love for Sherlock Holmes and it, you know I I was most impressed about it when we did nerve and knowledge and you had all these physicians all over the world who wrote journal level articles medical journal level articles about medicine and Sherlock Holmes 
it, it's just always continuous, uh, uh, continuously amazing to me. Have the two of you come across any other kind of uh, hobby or avocation that is non-work related where people put this much effort and passion into into it? I haven't. Well, I, I've, I can't say that I've, I've been a totally active participant, but certainly I have a, a lot of interest in the American Civil War. Mm. And there's a huge group of people, both North and South, who do immense amounts of work as reenactors. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, and there's, there's a whole sort of network of, of organizations throughout the United States called the Civil War Roundtables, um, which, which are, have speakers and educational programs, and, and they've been around for a long time. So I, I think there are some other avocations that, that get uh, that get a lot of interest. I, I I think all of us like to think that that the Sherlockian world is is uh, is special because we get people from so many walks of life, as Andy said, that that are willing to that, that are enthusiastic, more than willing, enthusiastic about contributing so much. The the other thing that that strikes me about about these books, and you know, Scott was kind enough to mention this is this is our fifth book that, that Andy and I have been involved with together, is you'd think after five books there aren't any new ideas and you know, everything that's worth saying was said twenty years ago and, and that sort of thing and you become you, you you wonder if you're going to become jaded. And I think Andy will will share this idea that that, that every time we do one of these books, we're just stunned by the the originality of of some of the material, most of the material that 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 ends up appearing in the book. And of course, Bert just mentioned his discovery of this sort of real life inspiration for Bertie Edwards and 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 the Altamont character, um, and and some of the stuff that that comes to us is is almost co- not not coincidental, but but just sort of almost accidental. Um, Greg Ruby wrote a wonderful chapter about the war service of Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. Now, some of us knew a bit about Rathbone's war service because he discusses it in his autobiography, but the fact that Nigel Bruce had an involvement in World War One that really affected the rest of his life and perhaps even shortened it um, was totally new to me. And, and Greg had um, runs a very nice website for his his organization, which is devoted to numismatics and medals and coinage and that sort of thing, called the Fourth Garadim. And some some years ago, he had a posting about Rathbone's military medals, and he contacted me <laughs> as we were putting the book together, and said he was going to do a posting about Nigel Bruce, and asked me to take a look at the um, <coughs> excuse me for, for coughing. He asked me to take a look at the, the the manuscript as he was working on it, and I said, you know, Greg, not only do I really like this, but how about if you take your night your Basil Rathbone piece, from, you know, the website that you you've done, <coughs> excuse me, work on getting some additional material, combine that to what you're doing with Nigel Bruce, and turn it into an article for uh, trenches. And Greg said, sure, he'd, he'd love to do that. And he did a great deal of research. And if you read his article, you can tell he's got illustrations. He got the pictures of their service records and picked up all sorts of fascinating information, you know, contacting people in England and, and, and record offices. And it's a real contribution to our literature. and something that, that as I said, I, I, I certainly knew, particularly as far as Nigel Bruce goes, absolutely nothing. And... It was one of these one of these events that uh, started with Bob. Would you take a look at what I'm working on? What do you, let, let me know what you think. And that morphed into really, I think, a wonderful contribution from Greg. So there's always always something new that's out there that none of us realized was out there. Yeah, and you know this this dovetails nicely with what you wrote in the introduction to Trenches, uh, where you said. First of all, his last bow is a story packed with surprises. You know, from from the moment that uh, Altamont reveals himself to be Sherlock Holmes, still elicits a gasp, third-person writing style of the tale is a constant puzzlement. But more so, you know, just in this this tale with Greg, you know, I think there are a lot of surprises in the making of the book or in some of the pieces that were submitted. 
So what were, what were some other pleasant surprises or unexpected happenings that uh, you can recount over the uh, assembly of this, uh, this tome? Well, one of the things is that I had never tasted Tokai before, but Patricia Guy's yeah, Patricia Guy is an expert on a lot of things. One of them is wine. And she wrote a wonderful chapter on Tokai and uh, the history of it and uh, w- w- which years were the best. And it, it was a, it made me go out and buy a bottle. And it was, <laughs> it was really uh, a, a nice surprise just there because how many times have we read about it? And never really understood what the symbolism of it was. Hmm. And and how yeah. was it? How was how was the Tokai? Very sweet. Hmm. Yeah. A dessert wine. Yeah. Well, yeah. it is a, it is a dessert wine, you know. But those of us who have frequented it in the past, as Bob knows, the Sons of the Copper Beaches in the older days, when we had a little bit more flexibility about what could be brought in. At the end of the meal, we had uh, Bob Pigeon, sainted Bob Pigeon, would bring in um, example, uh, well, great ports and Stilton and fruit and all sorts of things. But for several, well, at least one year, I remember he brought in Tokai yeah. and explained the, the amazing um, aspect of Tokai, which is the sweetness rating, which I think is in, in degrees of Putin, uh, I can't remember the exact word. It's a word like Putinesca or something like that. But that there's all sorts of variations and subtleties in Tokai, and that it's that and that if and that if I remember right, it's made from champagne grapes that sort of ferment naturally in the fields and are then gathered. It's it's you know not, talk about a rabbit hole. You know, it's another mm-hmm. amazing sort of story that uh, would never have come to my notice unless I had unless if I had not been at that particular meeting of the Sons of the Copper Beaches or if if you if you read trenches ah right, right. <laughs> ah, there you go now, two did, surprises that, that that come to my mind one of which is is that uh, the manuscript is not complete there's a yeah roughly 50% of the text survives and several pages are are missing and I, I it was my just i think naive assumption that some of the pages just got trashed somehow during the you know the course of the passage of time and um when we actually got to see the the scan of the manuscript um what what i think it's important to note is that it's not that the first half of the manuscript is missing and the second half is present or vice versa. They're seemingly random pages are missing. You know, you have like two pages intact and then a page is gone and then you have another page and that sort of thing. It's, 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 uh, uh, it's not a, the pages that are missing are not sequential, which again, I just described as some type of random, you know, the cat ate my manuscript or, or you know, <laughs> There was a house fire or something like that, and it turns out that in, in Randall Stock's chapter on the manuscript itself and its history, he comes up with what I think is a absolutely brilliant explanation as to why those pages are missing, and it's not by accident. And I'm not going to say anything more about it, but oh, come on. I, I think he's really hit on something. You, you can't keep us in the dark. Um, well, it has to do with the public. It's a complicated story, and I'm not going to try to to tell it completely because I'll make a mistake, but it has to do with the publication history okay. and edits and revisions that were made in the, um, I guess, the galleys and the various editions, both American and British, that it went through and changes that were made uh, during the course of the publication process as to why some pages may have been discarded. But mm. it's, a, it's a wonderful piece of analysis. And Andy, I, I wonder what your reaction was. We, we talked about it a few years ago already. But, uh, well, Randall, R- Randall shows that uh, while there's a page missing, it looks like the bottom of page 11 of the manuscript fits perfectly with the top of page 13. Huh. So the question of you know what happened to 12 well it may be that conan doyle didn't like it and tore it up 
I mean, the other thing is that this this manuscript is very different from the others that we've uh, done books on in that uh, the others uh, have this crisp, clean script with, you know, very few changes, whereas this one has quite a lot of changes. Yeah. And um, it's so it's it's really very different. It is. It is unique. I mean, you know, not only do you have, you know, a few changes here and there in terms of words crossed out, but, you know, we, we, we take this terminology for granted now working electronically uh, of, of cut and paste. And there is literally cutting and pasting that happened uh, within and throughout this manuscript. And um, I think I think Randall's analysis, you know, that kind of piecing together of the puzzle is uh, is fascinating because this is very different than any of the other manuscripts that have been published by the BSI Press uh, to date. Yes. The- now, now this is this must be the latest manuscript that we ha- that the BSI Press have have published, isn't it? I mean, chronologically. Well, yeah, I, th- I think so. Yeah, because um, some of the later ones are still in copyright. So that 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 would be a, a secondary issue, but I think it's probably you're right. The the the, the latest, the most recent, whatever you want to call it, chronologically that we've yeah. that we've done. So that so that some of these things could be the effects of age. I mean, as he got older, you know, he was uh, could be have Conan Doyle yeah. age. You mean? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's possible. The, you know, the other thing, just visually. Uh, I, I was struck by this because when I got the book, the first thing I did was turn to the pages that that showed the manuscript. Uh, which, for for those of you listening who haven't yet purchased a BSI Press book, this is one of the most remarkable and inventive things I think about the uh, the presentation here. Is that on on one page on the right side of the book you have a, a fairly large scan of the original manuscript, and on the facing page on the left, you have the typed out version uh, with you know, any notes that uh, that might be there as well. Uh, so it's very easy to uh, to scan through it yourself. But in in looking at the images of the manuscript, I noted that a number of the pages uh, look like uh, look like half sheets, look like it, almost like it was written in. Uh, in in landscape rather than portrait, if you will, you know we're used to that full uh, sheet that Conan Doyle used in some of those uh, uh, sketchbooks or uh, uh, composition books, and in this case, it's uh, it, it, it looks like it's been turned on its side. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um, the empty house manuscript is is in composition books, so as I recollect, the pages are all uniform. Mm. Um, this one has got the, uh, and, and this one, of course, we, we have not seen the original. We we just had the, the the availability of the scans, but you can tell that that there's a lot of variability in, in the actual size of the sheets. And as Andy said, something may have been torn out. And and Scott, you said things were literally cut and pasted. Um, and it's it, it's it's very interesting. To me, one of the other nice surprises was the other manuscript in the book, which was from my Keynes collection of the uh, Ypres 1915. A poem that Conan Doyle did, and uh, Mike Keane's extraordinarily generous of, of both his his collection and his time. But it's this is the kind of, of um, item that that's of interest to all of us as Sherlockians and, and Doyleans, if you will. That had there not been a book coming out on World War One and his last bow. The, the occasion to present this manuscript of the, of the poem and to make it available just would not have presented itself. Yeah. Um, and because we were doing it, Mike said, oh, by the way, <laughs> would you like to have, you know, this, this four-page handwritten Conan Doyle poem? And, of course, the answer was yes. And, and Mike, in addition, though, did a marvelous uh, article discussing the the poem and its context and history. And again, that's one of these things that probably would never have seen the light of day if there hadn't been the stimulus to uh, to put together this book. So every every you know almost every chapter contains some type of surprise to us, which is which is which is great. I mean, it it, it makes editing it a pleasure and and. Uh, 
hopefully we're, we, we've now been able to, to be involved with something that is presenting things that are new. Yeah. And, and I, I, I want to say, um, I, this BSI weekend, I went to the Morgan Library, and they had a an exhibit on a, a Dickens and a Christmas Carol. And they, in the gift shop, they had a manuscript book of a Christmas Carol. Hmm. And what they had was the text of a Christmas Carol on one page, and then next to that, on the next page, was a scan of the manuscript. For that page and that's all they had i mean it, that's all that was in the book we do such a much more uh, extensive job showing w- the cross outs and phil Burgum does a really wonderful job on uh analyzing these manuscripts and we're all the beneficiaries of that absolutely yeah i mean talk, talk about looking at every single ink spot <laughs> and and discerning its significance is is it is something that Phil has, has really just become enormously skilled at, and he, he's just a great resource to the Sherlockian world in general, and, and certainly BSI Press in particular, because he's just so meticulous about his approach to these things, and he's he's just a gem. In in thinking about what little you know, or perhaps what your intermediary knows about the anonymous owner of this manuscript. Uh, what are the odds that uh, it may either come on the market at some point, or that it might um, it might have some sort of public display where folks can see it in more detail? Well, we have no I- we have no idea, and frankly, uh, personally, it, it, that's not of much interest to me because uh, I'm just grateful to the anonymous owner who uh who let us use the manuscript and um uh, i really uh you know i've respected his or her request that they remain anonymous and and that's fine with me bob and i were able to put out a book that took advantage of their generosity and so um uh that was the only thing of interest to me yeah we we know that the that the donor has um, received copies of the book. Oh, that's um, good. Uh, yeah, we thought that was the least we could do. <laughs> yeah. No, we, we 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 he he the 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 donor he or she because uh, I'm not sure has received copies and hopefully um, that person will be pleased with it. Uh, Scott, you asked me earlier, you know, something something about the the intermediary even and. I don't think Andy and I are trying to be evasive. I, I think, as he said, we're just grateful that. Well, in, in this, fact, this thing, Bob, we named the intermediary in the introduction. So well, it, I, I, I know you did, but let's leave that as a mystery so uh, folks okay. can buy the book. Did we name the intermediary? Yeah. All right. Well, well, we'll leave it as a mystery for the readers to <laughs> to, to, to to see. But it, he's 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 obviously a, a a great Sherlockian and a friend to a friend to all of yeah. us. So uh, we'll we'll leave it at that. I I did like. Uh, one thing I was I was pleased about, and, I, and, and Andy readily agreed with me, is in addition, I guess, to naming the intermediary in in the uh, the introduction, I, I'd kind of forgotten about that temporarily. We we did mention that the donor is the Abel Magwitch of the Sherlockian world. So those of you that remember Great Expectations will, uh, I hope, appreciate, and I hope that the donor appreciates that. Uh, that that metaphor, absolutely. Uh, that, that comparison. That's great. Um, now but we're just appreciative that somebody came forth and 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 literally gave this to us. Yeah. Now, now but I, I, I'd like to talk about some of the other chapters. Well, because b- before you do, Andy, I just I, okay. I don't want to I don't want to belabor this, but I I think it's it's worth pausing on for a moment. Um, I know we don't know much or anything about this person, but of what we know about. The manuscripts, and Randall has done an amazing job uh, kind of tracking and chronicling all of the known uh, manuscripts on his website, The Best of Sherlock Holmes. What Do, do we know of any manuscripts that are owned by non-Sherlockians? That is, does this rise to the level of interest to a non-Sherlockian collector that they might go out and purchase a, a manuscript. Well, I, I think if someone is a, a 
a student of World War I, um, it has enormous interest mm. because we have so much history in this book uh, about World War I that uh, you can't help but come out of this better informed. For example, you know, we, Marina Stajic wrote a chapter on European complications of the outmost moment. Basically, it's about Serbia and the Austro-Hungarian government, and, you know, she's from there. So she has this terrific historical knowledge about the history of her own country, and it comes through just beautifully in her chapter. Absolutely. Yeah, let me just just for a second to get back to Scott's question, though, about about manuscripts and speaking for a minute with my relatively new hat as co-publisher of of BSI Press, along with John Berquist. Um, If you go back through the manuscript series so far, not all of the manuscripts are owned by Sherlockians. The the, um, empty house is is at uh, the Rosenbach and and, um, Second Stain is at Haverford College. And there are two that are uh, at the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas. So, so these are these are just very valuable literary properties to people that are book collectors. You know, it's, it's, you don't necessarily have to be in the BSI to want to own a uh, a Sherlockian manuscript because they're very few and they're they're valuable. And of course, Sherlock Holmes is such a ubiquitous character in in literature. We're fortunate, however, at getting getting back though to the manuscript series that. Several of the manuscripts are owned by members of the Baker Street Irregulars who have been extraordinarily generous in, in, in allowing us to use their material, and not just manuscripts, but supporting materials. Costa, we, Costa Rizak, as we mentioned, provided illustrations. The University of Minnesota, when we did, uh, uh, I'm, I'm blanking, and you'll remind me which volume it was, um, where the galley proofs, which is the only, the, the, it's, it's, uh, I, I think it's, Second stain. Um, the galley proofs for that that uh, story uh, are owned by Costa, and he again let us use them. And that's the only one of the sixty stories for which there are existing galleys. So right. that that was a real find. I, I think I can I can fairly disclose that the the next volume in the manuscript series is going to be edited by uh, coming out in January. This coming January uh, is uh, by Glenn Riker. And it's the Black Peter manuscript, and he's doing a marvelous job with that. So we're, we, we, we benefit from the fact that uh, people within our society have these items, but they're not the only folks that have them, and we've been very lucky in being able to just collaborate with other institutions uh, who are making it available. And uh, I'm delighted to hear from Andy that, that the BSI does a more meticulous job with our manuscripts than even the Morgan Library does with Dickens. So that's... <laughs> That's very exciting. Yeah, it is. So let's get back to uh, to World War One because that does yeah. occupy uh, quite a bit of this book. And as you stated, it was it was the origin of the book before you had your your hands on the manuscript. Uh, what other elements of World War One history or, uh, or or World War One as it relates to uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, are are worthy of note here? Well, Andy mentioned Marina's article, which which is which is lovely, and and uh, of course she has not only a, an intellectual interest in it, but a just a very personal one because she she is from that part of the world. And uh, uh, years ago, before we even did this book, when when I, Andy, I think you remember when Marina worked with us on nerve and knowledge, and of course she's a renowned toxicologist. She mentioned to me just you know socially that someday she'd like to do an article about Sarajevo, hmm. and I just happened to remember that when we had the chance to do a book on, on World War One, and I, we got in touch with her and said, Marina, are you still interested in doing something on Sarajevo because of the, you know, the assassination that, that took place there? And it was, you know, sure. And, and we, we got that very nice article from, from her. You mentioned Rebecca Romney, who was recently on this, on this podcast, and Rebecca did for the Baker Street Journal uh, a few years back uh, a, a marvelous article applying, as, as Bert said, biblical kind of exegetic criticism to the canon, and we thought it would, she did such a good job with it, we thought it would be fun to ask her to apply that technique specifically to his last bow, and she did, and I, I think it's a really intellectually stimulating uh, article. Andy, you mentioned you, you wanted to comment on some of the other 
other papers, so maybe there's well, a good moment. Ross Davies' article on uh, European diplomacy, it, it's, it's just pack, you know, packed full with historical information. Uh, Hartley Nathan on uh, the homes and the politicians. Uh, Catherine Cook's article is just terrific about uh, the whole Conan Doyle as a prophet of the First World War. Uh, a number of people mentioned the uh, the story he wrote called Danger, mm-hmm. and the, the Germans actually thanked him for that because it gave them an idea about how to <laughs> attack uh, England. It, it's just wonderful, and through the well, book- Michael Mears article. Now, Scott, you've asked me to to spill a bit of the beans about. Randall's interpretation of, of, you know, the missing pages. Uh, I'm not going to spill any beans about Michael Mears article because you have to, it's, 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 it's an, it's an, it's a, an interpretation of his last bow story that is unique. It's both very clever and very funny. And I'm just going to tell you that you have to read it to enjoy it because if I say anything more about it, I'll give away his very clever ideas. And I don't want to do that, but it's, it's, it's a delightful piece of, uh, uh, piece of work on his part. And Maria Fleischhack gave uh, a, a terrific chapter on uh, the German view of his last bow. Cliff Goldfarb talked about Conan Doyle as a propagandist. E.J. Wagner talked about Von Bork and, the, and spying. Just oh, and one of the other surprises, talking about, you know, related to, to contributions, was uh, Nicky Tekken. Now, we'd asked Nick to write about um, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson after November 11th, after the armistice. We have a nice piece from Peter Calamai about Watson during World War I. Mm-hmm. Um, but we asked Nick to write an article about Watson and Holmes after World War I was over. And what we thought we'd get from Nick was um, kind of a whimsical piece about, you know, these two guys growing old and that, that kind of thing. And what we really got instead, and it's much better than... than uh, what I had originally, and Andy and I had originally had in mind, is a marvelously insightful analysis of the case book. Is that, that a fair assessment, Andy? Yeah. Uh, it, it's really one of the best analysis analyses of the the later stories and 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 the later sort of published material uh, about about Sherlock Holmes and Watson that I've seen in a long time, and it's 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 really a very um, as I said, insightful analysis of those stories. It's not what we had expected when we asked Nick to to do the piece, but nevertheless, it's marvelous. So, um, uh, you know, again, we we were we were surprised not only at some of the stuff that we'd come up with, but we were equally surprised by by what a, a fascinating job our contributors gave back to us into the book. Mm-hmm. So, five books in. You've worked with dozens of contributors, and each volume uh, has its its charm, uh, and and I don't think there's a, there's a weak spot in any of them, and and I think that goes to both your skill as editors and your uh, ability to choose the right people for the right topic. But as you've done that, and and I don't want any names in this case. Have you ever had to reject a piece? Have you ever had to work so hard that it seemed like it wasn't worth it on on, on any contribution to one of these volumes? There are people who – there have been times when we have gone back to uh, contributors and said, you know, this is much too long. We're cutting it back substantially. There have been times when we've said – it, this is speculation that doesn't have a basis. Either you have to give a basis for it, or or remove the speculation. There have been. There was one time when we even wrote a portion of a chapter for an author who seemed unable to be able to complete what he or she was supposed to do. Mm. That's all. Oh, I part remember of, that one. Yeah. <laughs> it, that, I mean, that's all we. That's all part of being an editor. I, I think we take an active role. 
in uh, responsibilities of making sure that the that the book is as we envisioned it. Mm. And so, yes, the, 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 I don't think that there was ever a time when we rejected a submission because of quality. There was one time when someone published the s- submission before the book came out in something else. Oops. And we don't, Bob and I don't publish, we don't include things that have already appeared in print. So, we excise that chapter from the book, mm. but we do take an active role as editors to make sure that the book is as high quality as we can make it. That's why and if, the thing if, is, if I ever get selected is, by the two of you to, to contribute, I'm going to do mine an interpretive dance. <laughs> and you know, Scott, so we there's haven't always had the first that before, time. so that, yeah, there's always the first time. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, though, to, to take Andy's comments a little further, is, of course, as editors, it's our job to edit. And, and right. you're right that, that you don't always get something that you think is, is exactly what you wanted the first time around. But uh, I think what Andy and I have found is, is that everybody has uh, been very good-natured about um, accepting the editing and working with us. And, and in a few cases, as you said, we got something that was either too long or it didn't quite come to the conclusion that we thought they were going to come to or they, they didn't quite... You know, they didn't take the, the the article as far as we thought it could be taken, that sort of thing, and and we've worked with them, but they've by and large just been very cooperative and good natured and willing to 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 make those changes. So it's it's you know I I, I think it's fair to say, Andy, that we're still friends with pretty much everybody that we've worked with, well, uh, <laughs> and, we've and in also, many cases gotten to make new friends. And, and we've also asked them to, in, in some cases, in a lot of the cases, they've appeared in many of our books, and they keep accepting the responsibility for doing a chapter, despite having worked with us before. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to mention Tamar Zephrin's article yes. on further reading, because it's really terrific. And, and, you know, she's an archivist professionally, and she's found some quirky additional readings. And, uh, you know, the whole thing is just, the whole book is just packed full of good information. And one of the things I want to credit Andy with, because when we, the first time we did a book together, which was um, the wrong passage, Andy was the one who said, one of the things that we should do as as editors is to try to come up with at least one, and, and at least one, and, and in some cases more than one, articles that people that are newer to the Sherlockian world can um, can contribute. And we 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 reached out to some people um, who are very talented. Uh, but they're either younger or they're newer to the Sherlockian world. And we thought that this, and Andy really, I, I give the credit for, for coming up with this idea, said let's get these people that we know are bright and we know have things to offer, let's get them used to um, working in publication and, and, and publishing in the Sherlockian world. And um, we particularly used that last chapter the, for further reading as a springboard for um, people to get used to contributing to the Sherlockian literature. And what, what to me is very, very uh, gratifying is that many of them have gone on to not only publish a great deal more, but have gone on to become members of the Baker Street Irregulars. Andy mentioned Tamar, uh, who you know, about a year or so ago received her shilling. Um, Maria Jen Fleischer. Aker. I'm sorry? Jen Aker. Jen Aker uh, contributed yeah. to, was it Nervin Knowledge, the, the for further reading section? Uh, Maria Fleischak did the f- further reading section for um, Out of the Abyss, and then she contributed this article to um, uh, to this book about Germany, and she recently became a member of the Baker Street Regulars. Uh, Chris Zordan contributed to um, Nerva Knowledge. So we, we, you know, and as I said, I credit Andy with, with coming up with this idea. We, we've consciously looked for some of the newer Sherlockians to participate, and not only has that given them, I, I hope, the, the pleasant experience of um, contributing to the Sherlockian literature, but they've all done a terrific job. Um, and we, we've gotten to see just how talented these folks are. So, you know, part of it is, is as in the four of us are members of the Baker Street Irregulars, our task, as, as Bert and Scott remind us periodically on this podcast, is to keep the memory green. 
right, guys? I mean, this is this is what we're supposed to do. Absolutely. And I think by encouraging new talent to um, participate and get involved and write and publish and, and learn that sort of thing, uh, that that's part of our our obligation of holding a shilling is is to do that kind of thing. So that that's just been it's been fun because they're delightful people to work with. And it's been gratifying because they've done such a darn good job. Yeah. Well, they have. They have done a, a darn good job, and you know, as, as part of the outcome of that, you have a real opportunity to look at these characters and these situations in new ways. And one of the things that's in the book that helps you do that are the illustrations by Freddie Steele. Yes. Uh, which one of which you have on the cover, but the really interesting thing about um, you know taking a look at at Sherlock Holmes in this uh, case, you know, and you've mentioned I think already that Costa very kindly and um, uh, provided the opportunity to have uh, reproductions of some of these images here. But one of the things that you get when you look at it, you know. You have this fascinating introduction of Altamond. Uh, the character of Altamond is looking something like Uncle Sam. And here we have a Sherlock Holmes in Freddie Steele's images who looks more like a shaggy Lionel Barrymore <laughs> than, than, than the great aquiline profile of William Gillette. You know, he looks... Um, uh, so we have Steele's illustrations, which I think are all done in charcoal. And I don't remember – were these actually uh, – I know they did. They were, they were done for Collier's for, the, right. for September 22nd, 1917. And there's one here from the University of Minnesota. But the interesting thing is these are all done, I think, in charcoal and pencil and maybe with some white chalk for highlighting. But – here, very, very different from other Freddie Steele illustrations, you have the sort of gloomy evening on the coast of England. You've got von Herling and von Bork on the terrace. You've got Altamont and von Bork talking, illuminated by the firelight. You've got the astonished face of the captive von Bork. And best of all, you've got a, sh a, a illustration through the window – of complacent, somnambulant Martha and her cat as Martha sits <laughs> knitting by the lamp. Really, you know, remarkable. You know, you think about how looking at the manuscript, looking at the typescript, looking at the story, the process that Steele would have gone through to think about what scenes, what aspects of the story, what he wanted to present and how. Really interesting. Gives you some insight into his thinking as well. And the nice thing is that as opposed to... In, in of course, you're, you're an expert on steel, is that so many of the published reproductions and illustrations are reproductions of reproductions or the reproductions of the original printed version. These five illustrations are actually scans of the originals. Mm -hmm. So you, you pick up, I, I think you pick up some details that are not evident in looking at something that's, you know, a, a picture of a picture of a picture. Um, we should also mention... Um, John Burquist, who who you know is our production manager and, and just works so hard and is so thorough and 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 such a delight to work with uh, in putting these books together. I mean, you know, John is I, I I'm very glad that I had a chance at the last BSI dinner last month to to stand on the podium for a moment and talk about trenches in the other book that BSI Press put out, Mobile Homes, but was edited by Walter. And I did mention that John is the unsung hero of BSI Press because he really is uh, and deserves right. a lot of credit. He's kind of one of these guys who you know, works in the background but works superbly well. Mm -hmm. And we should mention that Steve Doyle and Mark Gagan did the, 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 the work on producing the cover. And they, they really just did a uh, – it's a very striking cover. I think uh, the four of us would agree. And, and they had the idea to publish Trenches in that kind of stencil – Look that you see on army duffel bags, and and uh, uh, I think it's it's the the, you know, the titles to the Mash movie. And I, I remember my dad when he, you know, his 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 uh, Footlocker from World War II has his name stenciled 
in that same kind of stenciling. And when you see that from across the room, you know it's it's military and it's 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 uh, it's about a war, and and you really get get an idea of what the book is about just by seeing the 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 actual print that they use to do the uh to do the title yeah uh, we should yeah. mention I, you, know, you asked us about the title eh? do you want to tell can we can we take a moment just to tell you how we can, how the title trenches was evolved because it's different from other books in the manuscript series well, you want to tell that story, Andy? Trenches, usually they take a line. The people who make the decisions on titles take a line from the story and use it. And so we go through the process, you know, Bob and I being somewhat controlling. Uh, <laughs> a long time ago, we decided we would propose to those people the lines that we found in the story that would make a good title. And we did the same thing in this case. And then I don't remember who it was who said, you know what? Trenches is such a good name. Why don't we just call it Trenches? Well, the the origin of the word Trenches is that we used it, you know, we and and Bert, you know, because you were corresponding with us as we put the book together. You want to come up with a a code word when you're working on a book. I'll call it a working title, but it's not even a title. It's a code word because you don't want to say, hi, Bert, how is your chapter in the book? about World War One and Sherlock Holmes coming. You know, it gets kind of verbose. So we, we just picked the word trenches as our as our code word. So we'd say, you know, how are you doing working on trenches? Because, you know, it, it conveyed the sense of World War One, And it's an eight-letter word rather than using a, a you know, eight-word line or something like that to describe the book we're working on. So that was really an operational title. And when we went through with our... You know, we talk with, with a variety of people in BSI Press and, and Mike Whalen as to what title it is. We couldn't really come up with a, a phrase from the the story that um, that really put it together as a title. And, and then Mike said, oh, I had Trenches is just such a striking title. Let's use it. And that's how we ended up with it. So that worked. Out. We should also tell the secret of what's under the dust cover. Oh, this is I love this because the the dust jacket for all of these volumes uh it, it, they're beautiful, you know, and and this is uh, again a colorized version of one of the Frederick Dor Steele uh illustrations. But if you if you're uh brave enough to unwrap the book, take that dust jacket off, uh you'll find a beautiful uh you know, cloth bound book, uh hardcover uh, black cloth with gilded uh, uh, titles on the spine, and a little phrase in Conan Doyle's handwriting on the front cover. You want to tell us about that, Bob? Well, my favorite line in the canon is, there is only one man. You know, when, when Von Bork awakens from from his uh, chloroform-induced coma or whatever, um, and he demands to know who is it that's, that's taken, you know, taken him prisoner. Sherlock Holmes doesn't quite say who he is. It's that marvelous exchange where he says, well, I basically resolved the problem of your cousin, the King of Bohemia, and I did this and I did that. He never really says I'm Sherlock Holmes. And suddenly you can, you can physically sense that moment of recognition and shock as von Bork suddenly realizes that he's been trapped by Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> but he never actually says it. And he, and he, and he, he's, he's bound up and he's, he's trussed like a Turkey and he's on the sofa and he suddenly sits up and he says, there is only one man. And that to me is, it's, 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 it's my personal favorite line in the whole canon because it kind of sums up Everything we know about Sherlock Holmes, there is, when you think about it, in, in literature, in, in reality, in, in, in all of the work that we've done as Sherlockians, there is only one man, and he's Sherlock Holmes. So I love, that, I love that line, and we talked about it as a chapter, but it's just too many words. But it turns out that the, the page that has that phrase on it, there is only one man, is missing. No. It's not there. Who could have gotten away with it? Yeah. Hmm. So, well, there was Berquist, only one man. <laughs> there was only one man, right? <laughs> so, Burquist had a had a brilliant idea, and, and Andy, I know, and, and I were back and forth about this, but I'm kind of happy with the way I'm delighted with the way it worked out. 
Berquist had the brilliant idea, and, and if any of you remember the movie Gladiator with, with Russell Crowe, um, uh, who was it that died? And one of the, the other, um, Oliver Reed died mm-hmm. right near the ending of the, um, the film. And he had like two lines of dialogue left that they couldn't, they couldn't shoot because well, he While died. they were still in production, right? While they were still in production, yes. right. He died while they were, or, or editing, whatever. The, but the point is, he, he never got to speak like two lines of dialogue. And, and you know, this multi-million dollar movie would have, could have gone down the tubes because Oliver Reed died. And what they did is using computer reconstruction, picked words that he had used in previous portions of the film and reconstructed that line of dialogue so that you really don't know that he was dead when, when the, the line is uttered. And what Perquist did was, because I, I love that, that line so much, is found those five words in, in the manuscript in Conan Doyle's hand in other parts of the manuscript that exist and put it together as an intact line <laughs> as to how it would have looked if the manuscript hadn't had that missing page. And that's what he's got. We've, we've got as the, as the guilt engraved wording on the, uh, the actual cover of the book, the cloth cover. And we do mention inside that how it was put together. So, you know, we didn't want anybody to, to be deceived, to think that, gee, where's that line in the, in the, the actual published part of the manuscript? It's, it's not there, but it, it, it's, it's, I, I think it was a wonderful idea to do the, the reconstruction. Um, and, and it's just a lot of fun, but yeah, I, in fact, what, what, Scott has uh, pointed out, if, if you want to go through some of the previous manuscript series books, look under the dust cover. If you haven't ever bothered to do it, there's a very nice surprise waiting for you because each of them has some type of an inscription on the cloth cover that's really, really pretty. Yeah. Well, this this has been fascinating, and, and we thank John Berquist for uh, working hard in the trenches to uh, come up with that solution. Oh. Ah. Sorry, I had to. Um, it was over the top. It was over the top. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when, when we think about the this series, um, it's it's not that there is only one man. There there are there are only two men who can edit it, and I know it's a cast of of scores of dozens of scores of people who uh, have contributed and brought it all together. But really. It's the two of you that continue to breathe life into volume after volume and really make these sing. The book is Trenches, The War Service of Sherlock Holmes. It is uh, an, another entry in the BSI Manuscript Series. It is available on BakerStreetJournal.com. Do not delay. Get over there and pick up a copy for yourself today. Bob Katz and Andy Solberg, thank you so much for sharing your stories and your wisdom and your dedication with all of us on this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Well, thanks for inviting us back. Yeah, it's always it's always a pleasure to talk with you guys. Uh, it's, it's like family, so <laughs> it's, it's just a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. One of the benefits of this podcast is that we bring you behind the scenes with some of the editors of the many volumes of the Baker Street Irregulars Press. Indeed, you've been treated to one such interview on this very episode. But there's so much more to find than just this particular volume. A quick visit to the Baker Street Journal website finds Out of the Abyss, a facsimile of the manuscript of The Empty House with Commentary. G.K. Chesterton's Sherlock Holmes, facsimiles of 19 original unpublished drawings illustrating the Sherlock Holmes canon, together with Chesterton's own writings on Sherlock Holmes and appreciations of Chesterton by leading scholars. Angels of Darkness, a drama in three acts, a facsimile edition of a portion of the manuscript and a complete transcript of the previously unpublished manuscript. Together, these form the basis of a fine collection. Individually, they stand as excellent examples of Sherlockian scholarship and an enduring record of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's artistry. Isn't it time you dug deeper than simply reading the Sherlock Holmes stories? 
Head on over to BakerStreetJournal.com and begin your journey with the BSI Press today. You know, it. people may look at this. Of course, if you're this far into the episode and you've heard this interview, we, we, you are probably not among them. But people may look at a book like Trenches and a discussion like this and say, boy, you know, this is uh, really sort of micro minutia into a particular avenue of fiction. But one of the things that occurred to me in listening to the conversation with Bob and Andy is how much insight we are getting and new knowledge we're getting about a major author like Arthur Conan Doyle that you would not have without this kind of publication series and these kinds of examinations. I mean, for example, it's not, it's not widely known, but Conan Doyle, during his life, during the Sudan, during the Boer War, during the World War, kept up a regular stream of suggestions for improving the lives of the men and their safety. He argued about the danger of submarines. He argued for a less class conscious military. He argued for armor for frontline troops. He argued for the use of camouflage. His petitions for flotation collars and rafts led to the first life jackets. He argued for a channel tunnel. The idea being that if Britain were blockaded in war, food could still be imported. He argued for the evolution of the cavalry. And it's this aspect of his interest in the impact that he had on the world around him. And he was such a a larger-than-life character that you would never really realize without work such as uh, has gone into publications like trenches yeah and and those things those elements of conan doyle's public support or ideas that he had they aren't new i mean they they certainly are available to the public but i think the point here is never before have they been brought under a a single cover and made available to everyone in one place and and put in context of uh, sherlock holmes's war service uh, it's, that's really where the value comes out here. Um, yeah. And, and we talked about this in, in the, the interview, that the fact that people are still uncovering new things after all this time, uh, it's just uh, really encouraging to hear that. So, you know, in a, in a related piece, uh, you know, in episode 133, we talked about the then-pending... Uh, auction of Dan Poznanski's sizable Sherlock Holmes collection. And I was able to participate in that in some very limited fashion. And one of the lots that I purchased was uh, 60 or so reference books. And they weren't named. There, there were a few that you could see in the photo, but they did not have pictures and descriptions of the entire lot. And much to my surprise, when that was delivered in a sizable box to my place, um, two of the volumes in there had to do with this very time, World War I. Uh, one is The Wipers' Times, a complete ah. facsimile of the famous World War I trench newspaper incorporating the New Church Times, the Kemmel Times, the Somme Times, the BEF Times, and the Better Times. Uh, that's a pretty sizable volume there. And uh, the other is uh, the Riddles of Wipers, an appreciation of the trench journal, the Wipers Times. So I just thought it was completely timely that uh, trenches should come out now uh, when I just actually uh, was able to acquire these two nice volumes, courtesy of Dan's collection. Oh, that's grand! Have you have you told Glenn about that? Because of course, Glenn Moranker, that's one of his big areas of interest. It is. Well, he I think he was one of the people who put together the lots. So I would. Oh, of course, of course, <laughs> he knows about it. But uh, the next time we see Glenn, I will uh, obviously mention that to him. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot that for a second. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it is that time in the episode where we get to our quiz. Canonical couplets, as we've been calling this. We give you a two-line poem that 
mentions something in the canon or references one of the stories, it is up to you to identify which story it is uh, that is incorporated in those canonical couplets. And as a reminder, only people who are regular donors to the show, either via PayPal or via Patreon, are eligible to play in this uh, in this quiz. Um, our last winner was Sandy Cozen. Sandy answered correctly and was the first to answer correctly uh, what the story was in this canonical couplet. Pig sticking in the nearest butcher shop was in this case a serviceable prop. That, of course, is the reference to Allardyce's butcher shop and Holmes coming home with the harpoon under his arm in Black Peter. So, get your pencil and your thinking cap ready for this canonical couplet, and if you don't yet contribute to the show via Patreon, get right over to the website and make yourself eligible. All it takes is as little as a dollar a month, or a dollar per episode, and you are eligible. And we'll have a nice Sherlockian giveaway for you, should you be the winner. So, randomly selecting one of our stories here, let's go with... Of all the ills with which our race is cursed, a poker-bending doctor is the worst. If you think you know the answer to this canonical couplet, jot it down. Send us an email at comment at ihearofsherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. We look forward to hearing from you. Excellent. I love those couplets. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've, we've got enough to go on for about 57 more episodes. <laughs> so we're good for a couple of years here. That's good. That, that, that's less work on our part. Uh, well, how is it that you've wasted another four hours with us? Wait, it wasn't that long, was it? <laughs> how the time flies. Uh, thank you so much for being part of our little world here. And uh, we hope you will continue to be such and that you will tell other people all about it. Leave us a rating, a review on the podcast player of your choice. And uh, please share this episode widely. Yes. And do us a favor. Before you leave, don't leave those dishes in the sink. Would you just please put them in the dishwasher? Oh, my goodness. What a mess. And close the door on your way out, will you? <laughs> my gosh. So I have to keep telling you. And pick up those socks. <laughs> well, in the meantime, I will remain the fastidious Scott Monty. And I remain the disorganized Burt Walder. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> the, the game's, game's afoot. afoot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.